Hello class, it is Monday and it's English and this is your last week of school so that's exciting. Um, I know that you guys are um, get, you're finishing strong and I'm so proud of you. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read our um, hymnal devotion to us and then we're going to jump into English and it's your last week. And they do not rest or not day or or not, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Revelation 4 8. Reginald Harbour was born April 21st, 1783, to a minister and his wife in an English village. After a happy childhood and a good education in the village school, he enrolled at Oxford, where he excelled in poetry and became fast as vicar in his family's parish for 16, oh, where he became fast friends with Sir Walter Scott. Following graduation, he succeeded his father as vicar in his family's parish, and for 16 years, he faithfully served his flock. He, his bent towards poetry naturally gave him a keen and growing interest in hymnology. He sent to lift the literary quality of hymns, and he also dreamed of publishing a collection of high-caliber hymns corresponding to the church year for using literature churches. But the Bishop of London wouldn't go along with it, and Herbert's plans were disappointed. He continued writing hymns for his own church, however, and it was during the 16 years in the obscure parish at Hodnet that Harbour wrote all 57 of his hymns, including the great missionary hymn from Greenland's Icy Mountains, which exhorted missionaries to take the gospel to faraway places such as Greenland and India. The hymn represented the earliest desire for Reginald, for he felt God was calling him to be a missionary in India. His desire was fulfilled in 1822 when, at age 40, he was appointed to oversee the Church of England's ministries in, uh, in India. Arriving in Calcutta, which is where Mother Teresa went, he set out on a 16-month tour of, of his dossier, visiting the village of Trinopoli, Trinopoli. On April 3rd, 1826, he preached to a large crowd in the hot sun, afterwards plunged into the pool of cool water, and he suffered a stroke, and he drowned. It was after his death that his widow, finding his 57 hymns in a trunk, succeeded publishing them. In this volume was the great Trinitarian hymn, based on Revelation 4, 8 through 11, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So sadly, he didn't make it, like most of the other people that wrote the hymns that we studied. But he's with Jesus, singing holy, 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 Lord of God Almighty, and that's all that matters. So that's a happy note. All right. We're going to um, 8.3 today, exercise 3, 1 through 5, and then you're going to do um, 8 point, we're going to skip to 8.5 and do exercise um, 1, 1 through 10 even. So I'm going to kind of walk it through you with, walk through it with you. Um, adjective clauses. A clause is a group of words that contains a subject and a predicate. An independent clause is one that can stand by itself. Those are the ones that we can use comma and, comma but, comma for, comma so to be able to, or comma yet, um, to be able to, to join those two independent clauses together to make a, um, like a complex sentence. A dependent clause cannot stand on its own. An adjective clause is one type of dependent clause that describes a noun or a pronoun. The word is the independent. Um, these words are called relative pronouns. So let's look at an adjective clause here. Um, adjective clauses can also begin with subordinate conjunctions, when, where, and why. So you guys are going to be doing um, exercise three, one through five. Um, so I'm just going to look with you for exercise one, so we can kind of get a taste of this a little bit. Identify the adjective clause in each sentence. People are fascinated with the history of surnames, which is another word for last names. That adjective clause is, um, which is another word for last names, and it's describing surnames. Let's do um, number two and number three together. An online phone directory is a place where you can find surnames from a wide variety of ethnic groups. Where you find surnames from a wide variety of ethnic groups is the adjective clause, and it's describing place. Genealogists, whose job is to study family history, 
You can also supply information about last names. Um, whose job is to study family history is the adjective clause there, and it's describing genealogist. Genealogy is a study that interests me. That interests me is the adjective clause, and it's talking about study. So hopefully you all can do exercise 3, 1 through 5 on your own there. And just skip on over to 8.5. And we're going to do exercise 1 through 10 even. So let's just take a look at this. Um, these dependent clauses may function as adverbs describing or giving information about verbs, adjectives, or another adverb. These clauses, called adverb clauses, tell when, when where, when, why, in what way, to what extent, or degree, and what condition. Adverb clauses are introduced by subjunctive conjunctions, some of which are listed below. So this is probably going to be the chart you want to look at to try to find some of your answers in here. After, although, as if, as long as, as soon as, as though, because, before, if, in order, that, since, then, though, unless, until. These words are ones that, if you start them at the beginning of a sentence, you have a comma at the end of your clause there. So let's just kind of take a look and exercise one since you're doing, um, you're doing the even problem, so I'm going to do the odd one with you. I'm going to do number one with you. Although it is almost extinct, the Florida panther is the state animal of Florida. Although it is almost extinct, has that comment, and that's the although is our key word. So that is our adverb um, clause there. Okay, number five. Sometimes, though, it can be at the end of the sentence, um, or not in the end, but in the middle of the sentence. Some panthers' deaths occur when the animals were hit by cars. Oh, that's sad. Um, when the animals were hit by cars, that's that adverb clause. Very sad, I know. Um, number nine there, speed zones don't seem to help if panthers wander onto the highway. If panthers wander onto the highway, is that adverb clause? We know we need to be looking for these key words over here on page 148 to find um, where our adverb clause is. Many times if it's at the beginning, if it's at the beginning of the sentence, just know it's going to have that comma. That's been something we've been working on this year, I know, in, in creative writing. So, I'm hoping that this is going to help you in your English skills and in your writing skills because these are always, a lot of these are very good um, Transitional words are good words to help with your writing flow. Um, so these are just good. This is good practice for you guys. All right, tomorrow we're going to read The Giver. Um, so what I'm going to do, so that way, um, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to read your devotion to you for tomorrow as well. And you can just go back in and watch this. So you don't have to, you can stop it now and just know that tomorrow morning, you're going to have this devotion. Um, because sometimes I forget to read it to you guys. So we're on Jonathan. That's where we're at. We're in our J name still. We're not going to finish this book, but that's okay. Um, Jonathan, son of Saul and friend of David. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, as well, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, his bow, and his belt. 1 Samuel 18, 3-4 In a world that typically looks out, of no, out for number one, we are amazed and even puzzled by people like Jonathan, King Saul's oldest son. In contrast with his father's flawed character, Jonathan repeatedly demonstrated himself to be brave, capable, and loyal. We first read about Jonathan when, we, when he was leading a thousand Israelites warriors to attack the Philistines. He, um, he and his armor bear risked their lives climbing to a cliff to attack the Philistines and sent them into a panic. Jonathan's leadership qualities earned him the respect of his men, who they refused to allow Saul to kill Jonathan for unwittingly going against Saul's order. Perhaps even more impressive than Jonathan's bravery is his selfless loyalty to David. Jonathan was poised to become the next king after his father, but David's own fact, acts of bravery were establishing him as leader among the people. Jonathan can get easily see 
David as a threat, but instead he became friends with David and pledged enduring loyalty to him and his descendants. Even sailing his committing a commitment by giving him his own robe and weapons. Later, he tipped David off to Saul's intent to harm him, and David had to flee. Jonathan died when his father, with his father in battle against the Philistines, and David composed a lament on his behalf. David was true to the pledge that he and Jonathan made to each other and either and their descendants. Years after Saul and Jonathan died, David saw out to one of Jonathan's sons, Mephibosheth, and granted him the the property of his grandfather Saul. David also allowed him to eat his, at his table like one of his own sons. The meaning is Jehovah given, and the first reference we see is in First Samuel thirteen two, and the last reference is in Jeremiah thirty eight twenty six. Okay, guys, I'll see you tomorrow morning on our Zoom meeting, and I'm hoping we're going to finish that giver up.